Good to not see you all, but at least be here with all of you. And uh, yes, uh, this is also my first webinar, so uh, I'm a, on a steep learning curve. Yes, my name is Nikolai Sist. I'm a co-founder of uh, a small impact company called End Learning. And together with Lucas, whom you, have, you will meet later on, um, we have uh, been very much involved in developing the peer practice method. So this is uh, an introduction to uh, the peer practice method, and uh, you will see some slides while I'm uh, I'm talking you through what is what is what is peer practice and why are we working with it. So um, please join me on the, on this uh, little uh, journey, and we will show a video as Angelot mentioned uh, through the presentation, uh, so you will get a a practical feeling of what a video could look like. There are many versions of, of peer practice videos, but uh, this is one example. So, uh, first of all, what is peer practice? Uh, peer practice is uh, a video ethnographic method uh, which is designed also with teachers to help teachers document and share their teaching practices. So, uh, we have worked with this since 2016 for three years now, so it's still a, a method in the making. We are still developing it, and that's also why we have this uh, project, the VPAL project. So it's been developed and tested with hundreds of teachers in Denmark and Greenland. And now with the VPAL uh, project, we are uh, expanding our territory to uh, uh, different parts of Europe, uh, you could see on the map earlier on. And we are very thrilled uh, to do so. And uh, a lot of interesting questions will come up on how can we actually understand each other's videos when we uh, record them on, on our own languages, the languages we use with our students or participants. So, <clears throat> so what is the challenge we are trying to address with, uh, with the peer practice uh, method? First of all, uh, teachers and maybe you will feel the same way, but uh, this is in general speaking, uh, often feel isolated in their daily work life. We, we are not together with other teachers. Uh, we talk with other teachers, but we are not in the, in the practice with the teaching situations with other teachers. We rarely see other teachers teach, um, and, uh, and also we rarely receive supervision. And that, is, uh, that can be supervision from principals or high headmasters, our leaders, or from uh, colleagues, peers. Uh, this is unlike uh, several other professions around in the world where we see, for example, psychologists, where you have a structured supervision scheme. Of course, some of you might have worked with supervision, uh, but this is uh, the general picture of teachers from primary school to secondary, high school and university, all the way up. So, um, also co-teaching is very rare. Uh, some people are doing it. Uh, we know for a fact that uh, in primary school, in the early stage, you have a tendency to see more co-teaching, but it's very rare. <clears throat> and that is due to, of course, uh, first and foremost, budget constraints. Uh, it's costly to be two people teaching in the same classroom or <clears throat> course situation. <clears throat> Sorry. So. In the, uh, the effect of this is that new methods and ideas and inspiration from others can be hard to find in a useful format. Uh, we, this, is, this is also why we are doing this. Possibilities for transfer <coughs> and dissemination are limited. So we have a problem of actually taking one practice from one set of teachers to other set of teachers and also spreading the good practices uh, amongst many. So this has the consequence of slowing down knowledge sharing, the professional development of teachers, and the development of teaching practices, because we don't work in an open source uh, culture where everybody can see what each other, each other uh, are doing. So what's the aim of peer practice? The aim is to support that useful didactic practices are shared and developed. and that teachers us, we will learn and develop professionally, more efficiently uh, in our daily work life. It is thought of as a supplementary uh, to the off-the-job trainings, which rarely have a significant impact on the teaching practices. 
So also with the peer practice, we're aiming to actually give a tool so we can develop in the day-to-day -day work we are doing. And this also comes from uh, our work for many years with entrepreneurs uh, around the world, where we see that entrepreneurs are actually developing both professionally, but also their practices in the making of their businesses or NGOs or cultural events or whatever they are uh, working on. Remember, video is just the tool. Of course, the peer practice method uh, is very much focused on video, but we are just seeing it as a tool for development. So how does it work in practice? Yes, peer practice videos are first and foremost teacher to teacher videos. This means it's not videos aimed at the learners. Some of you might have heard of uh, the concept of flipped learning. Flipped learning being videos instructing learners to make, uh, you know, instructing videos to learners so they can see at any given time uh, what they need to see on the video. This is not what peer practice is. Neither uh, it's a tool for actually helping learners make their own videos. Of course, if you get to know how to make videos, if you haven't worked with videos before, you can use the video skills you learn in this uh, training uh, course. You can learn them for multiple uh, yeah, uh, possibilities in your own classrooms, but this is not what we are aiming for. So, peer practice videos. It shows authentic teaching situations. We are not trying to show a beautification of reality. The videos are two to five minutes long and they are made on our own smartphones or tablets. Or if you don't have a smartphone tablet yourself, you can borrow one from uh, the institution. We have uh, tested this with a lot of different examples to see that if it's be, uh, below two minutes, the videos will not have sufficient information in it uh, that makes it really interesting. Above five minutes makes it difficult to actually find the time to see the videos. And as professional uh, teachers, we don't need to see so much to actually get an understanding of what is happening uh, in the practice, in the situation with our students, our participants. So, uh, you can imagine already by now that this, the peer practice videos, they are handheld thanks to all the YouTube videos of cats and dogs and whatever uh, you can see out there. And some of you might know the Danish uh, uh, directors of movies uh, who back in 95 made the Dogma 95 uh, manifesto. Uh, one of the guys is this guy, Lars von Trier. He, Made, uh, he was one of the four uh, directors, and, uh, and you can say, in a way, we are inspired. <laughs> I have many people are inspired by, by these guys. This is the, the manifesto for uh, Idioten, Idiots, uh, one of uh, Lars von Trier's movies. So one of, uh, one of the, I think it was uh, 10 things they, uh, they agreed on uh, on the Dogma movies was shooting must be done on location, the camera must, camera must be handheld, and optical uh, work and filters are forbidden. You can see uh, this is, we have our own dogma rules here with the peer practice videos. We are doing it with our own uh, cameras, the, uh, the, the, the smartphones or tablets we're using. So peer practice is designed as an action learning process in which we, the teachers, uh, learn by recording, reflecting, and interacting with peers. And that's the peer in the peer practice. We want to create a community, like Anshalad was also saying, this is very important that we create an open source learning community where everybody's contributing and helping each other in improving the practices. And of course, also improving ourselves as teachers in that process. I don't want to go through, through this, but just to give you an idea that we work structurally uh, in an iterative process, you could say, where we start off with identification and documentation, being the videos, and getting feed forward and feedback from peers, and then sharing it openly with uh, others, and then um, repeating the cycle uh, again and getting more interactive uh, feedback. So, 
Uh, I don't want to go th into the theory. Uh, Lucas uh, will be explaining you a bit more, but just to mention briefly that, among other things, uh, peer practice is based on the works of Jean Love and Etienne Wenger. Maybe some of you have heard of communities of practice. Uh, if you haven't, uh, you might want to look it up. So these communities are where practitioners identify, document, and reflect upon, also interact, uh, and further develop practice. You see a group of people working together. What we find is that, uh, and also the research of this, uh, that is developing to uh, zoom in on our own practice, actually to focus what are we really doing, but also to investigate our own practice, that is, have reflections, communicate, our didactic choices, why do we do, as we do uh, articulate those to, to peers, and see ourselves in action, observe ourselves, which can be challenging <laughs> the first times we do so. And also, as mentioned, get feedback from colleagues and interact. Finally, see the practices of others, also give us new inspiration and uh, possibility of relating uh, and mirroring ourselves. <clears throat> So the value of peer practice lies both in the process of making the video and the video itself. We have two kind of products. The process, I hope you will find both enjoyable, maybe it's sometimes frustrating, but for, uh, for one thing, for sure, uh, very, uh, as a learning process, very uh, uh, interesting to engage in. That's at least what we've seen with all the participants who've been participating in peer practice so far. And the videos itself, which will be uploaded on the VPAL platform, will be uh, a resource for further development. So peer practice is far from the only method using videos of teaching practices as a tool for development. Maybe some of you have heard of different methods. Uh, one of the very famous ones are Marta Mayo, uh, and the other one is Lesson Study. Um, there's uh, English UK-based uh, called Iris Connect. My teaching partner from the US, also Teach Stone, I believe, is from the US. Maybe you heard of others. Just to say we are not the only one working with, uh, with the t uh, videos of teaching practices. But we differ from those by that videos are produced with the aim to share and disseminate uh, useful practices in an openly format uh, that others will be able to see. It's not only for analytical purposes. And we keep the videos short and in an easily accessible uh, format to have the possibility of others be, uh, be using the videos um, as part of the inspiration and preparation. And we use colleagues, each other, as uh, the, the people who are actually giving feedback and feed forward. Not only a certified uh, coach uh, is, uh, is involved in this, and uh, as mentioned, we are developing or trying, aiming for, uh, to develop a community of practice. So where do we lie the focus? Where's the focus uh, of all this? The focus is on the practice, not on assessing the teacher. This is not a control uh, thing. It's on the contrary. Uh, and despite this, and we will come back to this, I assure you, uh, it can still be uncomfortable to share one's practice openly and at least also with people we don't know, but also with people we know. So for most people, uh, the fear and discomfort, it decreases as we plunge into it. We hear it all the time when we do peer practice trainings, people are afraid of, of, of doing it and feel uncomfortable seeing themselves or exposing themselves. But uh, we'll see, maybe you will find that this is the first or the second time you will experience this. <clears throat> so the focus is also here on the useful practice or inspirational practice rather than the best practice. We don't put a focus on the best practice because it gives us a closure. This is the ultimate practice we can uh, aim for. No, we're all the time aiming for using the practice we are, we are practicing uh, to, uh, to uh, get inspired to develop uh, new ones or even improve the ones we are working on. Um, so a practice is really good in itself. You know that already, I'm sure. Um, but a practice is, uh, can be useful for some in some situations and less good in others. So it's always the context that defines its worth, its value. 
Lucas will uh, come back on, on that, I'm, I believe. So, the focus is on documenting the smallest didactic breaks. It's not the entire house or uh, the full, uh, all the parts of our uh, teaching. It's only a tiny bit for each video. Then we can make more videos showing different parts of our practice. Uh, so we zoom in on small methods, uh, not the full course or a full lesson. You get the picture. Uh, it's uh, only uh, the small bricks, and then we can get the full picture uh, by building up the, the house uh, by all the small methods uh, we are sharing. So why videos? Um, I'm sure all of you uh, have an idea of, of why we use videos, but it can convey that it's difficult, what is difficult to communicate through the words alone. That can be methods, didactic methods, tools, routines, and teaching situations, as well as, as you see here, you hear my voice, you see my gestures. If there was a movement, I try not to move too much, but uh, you will always also be able to see that in videos. Words cannot uh, communicate that alone. At least it will take a long writing to, uh, you will need to write a lot to communicate, and it's not possible to get all the details. So there's a lot of packed information in videos. And video is growing exponentially as a tool for learning. Uh, you might be for other purposes using uh, videos yourself uh, when you uh, cook a new recipe or create something you haven't created before or repair something. Uh, the numbers out there on the internet is sh showing an exponential uh, growth uh, of, of videos used for different learning purposes. So videos also, unlike supervision, can be seen and analyzed and again and again when we put it into a professional setting like ours. And it can provide what we call a common third we can gather around and, and, uh, and see and relate to. And it can be shared and spread to uh, too many. Um, and it can support an open source learning culture. Not saying that supervision is not interesting. I'm a big fan of supervision. It's just to be realistic. It's not happening much around. Uh, so this is a very interesting tool which can do other things and supplementary to supervision and, and similar um, methods. So like in the world of the movies, this is not the world of the movies, but it's like in the world of video peer practice. Yeah, I don't know what happened there. Um, sorry, a little technical. Uh... Okay. Yes, yes. And that is uh, actually wonderful to have a little mistake because uh, that is one of our uh, main, uh, um, how can you say that, point that actually we want to embrace mistakes and we want to learn from mistakes and uh, this is not, we're not striving for perfection. Of course, we don't want to misuse your, our, your time here by, uh, by uh, making too many mistakes. So like in the world, on movies, back on the track here, peer practice videos uh, follows a clipboard that works as a structure for the videos. I don't want to go into this, but you will see that later. So it's, this is just a little cliffhanger uh, for you to, uh, to know that more is coming up. So you know this guy, you may be seen him on TV, Jamie Oliver. Uh, like when we see him cooking, we want both to see the practice itself, how he actually cook, how he uses his hands, and we want to hear his reflections. Why is he doing and putting things, ingredients together uh, in the way he does? The one without the other. Take Jamie Oliver out of the kitchen and just uh, interviewing him is not so interesting and just seeing what he's doing without hearing why is not so interesting. And that is the combination we are aiming for, com combining both the practice and the reflections of the pra on the practice uh, in the peer practice videos. So uh, enough of me talking for, for now because now it's actually movie time. And uh, Noah, maybe you can help me here. Uh, we are going to see Nissan, who was on a similar course uh, one year back in Weile, Denmark. And, uh, and uh, this is a four to five minute long video, a peer practice video made 100% by Nissan himself. So uh, Nissan, give it away, uh, Noah, whenever you're ready. 
hvor jeg underviser på div 2, modul 4-5. I dagens video der har vi fokus på, på mundtlighed. Mere specifikt så er der fokus på dialog, øh, og det er dialog i bestemte situationer. Og øh, i dagens opgave, som jeg har stillet eleverne, der har jeg opstillet øh, forskellige øh, situationer, f.eks. det at bestille en tid hos lægen, eller bestille et dækskifte hos mekanikeren, eller øh, bestille en tid hos tandlægen. Øh, hvad siger man egentlig, når man bestiller en tid hos lægen? Den her lektion er i øh, forbindelse med øh, samarbejdet med en øh, 6. klasse på Grejsdal skole, hvor øh, vi sammen med klassen arbejder i emnerne familie og traditioner. Det næste møde med den her 6. klasse fra Grejsdal skole øh, er der fokus på fagfagligt dansk. Øhm, og derfor så har jeg i den forbindelse øh, valgt at fokusere på øh, dialog øh, i bestemte situationer, som er atypisk i træningen øh, af moduldansk. Dialogopgaverne øh, er delt op i tre øh, lægeaftale, mekanikeren og tandlægen, hvor den første opgave er forholdsvis lige til, øh, og den tredje opgave er der nogle øh, omstændigheder, som øh, eleven skal tage hensyn til i øh, opgaven for at booke en tid. Og på den måde så sikrer jeg mig, at både den faglige svage elev og den faglige stærke elev bliver fagligt stimuleret. Og i morgen så skal I også øve nogle dialoger med eleverne. Så i dag så vi øver vi lidt nogle dialoger, som jeg har lavet. Og til sidst så skal I finde på nogle dialoger, som I gerne vil øve med de her elever her. Og nu skal I, skal I bare tænke, øh, hvordan man ringer til læge, fordi det er noget af det, jeg har lavet her i dag. Og det er også noget af det, vi har øvet, det der med at ringe til arbejdet, hvordan man man sig syg, og hvordan ringer man til lægen og får en aftale osv. Så, øhm, så derfor så skal I prøve at tænke på nogle situationer, hvor I tænker, den her situation ved jeg ikke, hvordan jeg skal kommunikere med den anden person. Det kan være, hvis I fx har købt noget tøj. Ja. Hvad siger jeg, hvis jeg gerne vil aflevere det tilbage igen og have pengene? For eksempel. Til min far. Til mit far. Ja. ja. Uh, mit far, jeg skal sige, han er syg. Uh, ja. ja. Mm. Uh, Han har ondt øh, i, hin, i sin mave. Ja. Kan du give mig rigtig ringes nummer? Ja, det er AX 22-22. Kan du komme op for mandag? Nej, jeg kan ikke, og jeg har ikke til os på torsdag. Kan du komme op for tirsdag? Ja, tirsdag er godt for mig, mellem halv tre til halv fem. Det er okay, vi ses på tirsdag. Den her øvelse giver eleverne øh, redskaber til at kunne øh, klare hverdagens situationer sprogligt. Øh, og i og med at øh, eleverne får øh, besøg af Grejsdalsskolens øh, 6. klasse, giver det også eleverne en mulighed for at få snakket øh, dansk på en ikke arbejdsmarkedsrelateret øh, måde. Og øh, det synes jeg... Og det synes eleverne også er ret vigtigt i forhold til at kunne øh, snakke øh, hverdagsdansk og kunne klare hverdagens mange øh, udfordrende situationer. Et godt råd til den her øvelse kunne være, at man lavede en skabelon til eleverne, øh, der vejledte dem i at øh, opbygge en dialog øh, på den korrekte måde med en indledning og, en, øh, og indhold og en afslutning. Øhm, til afslutningsvis, der vil jeg gerne sige, at det her, det er, synes jeg, er en utrolig vigtig del af, af dansk undervisning, som går tabt i øh, modulundervisningen, desværre. Øhm, så derfor, så øh, er det her min måde, ligesom at kunne bidrage til øh, hverdagsdansk. Yes. Has Nicolai, everybody seen? You are just on again. 
I, I need my slides. Yes, and thanks to Nissan for, uh, for this. I hope this gave you an idea on the, that Nissan here is both showing his practice and also reflecting on his practice, starting with a short introduction. So we are handheld, kept, uh, you know, where are we? What is the situation? Um, what kind of students or participants are we working with? And then showing bits of the practice, not the full practice, just to get an idea and then uh, having Nissan at the end uh, reflecting. Maybe you were, uh, did you, you saw that uh, someone else was actually recording Nissan when he was doing the introduction to, uh, to his, uh, his teaching. Uh, and, and I'm sure that this was one of the participants holding uh, his phone or his tablet uh, while he did that. So you can do that in various ways. Otherwise you can have a colleague, but that's, uh, it's more time consuming to have a colleague coming in. So, as you see here, peer practice supports us in showing our practice and reflecting on our didactic choices we make. Uh, so this is to grow a deeper understanding of the reasoning behind our choices and what we are aiming for, the learning outcome. Uh, key takeaways just to, uh, from this uh, video, I hope you, uh, you can see now. We both want to see the practice and hear the didactic reflections, but we also, we, we don't need to see everything. Uh, it's not uh, recording the full lesson. This video could even have been shorter, um, but it's nice to see how the participants are responding to the practice uh, Nissan is uh, introducing. Uh, and of course, uh, we could work on the reflections afterwards and go even deeper into that, but that's for the community also to contribute to. Uh, and like also in this, this video and, uh, and, and also the practice itself, we're not, uh, well, maybe we're aiming for perfection, but we don't want to show perfection. Uh, this, we want to have an authentic uh, and realistic picture into uh, what is going on in the classroom. So the more authentic, actually, the better. So in this uh, VPAL project, uh, the practices will be shown in our own language. This was a subtitled, a texted version. Um, but um, we will aim for that the didactic reflections, meaning both the introduction at the beginning and the reflections at the end, you know, where you see uh, Nissan talking to the camera, it will be in English so everybody will understand. That, that is at least what we are inviting you to. Uh, and, and it doesn't matter if you're not fluent in English, uh, we, none of us are. Uh, so we will help each other. It's the importance that we can actually try to communicate the, what we're doing. If it's not possible to communicate it in English, we will take hand of that. So um, as Ancelotte was mentioning in the beginning, we will make three videos each over this uh, period uh, and comment on minimum vi three videos made by peers and hopefully many others because it's actually also to get the comments from others which is uh, giving you an uh, incentive actually to share your own uh, practice. Yeah. So just finally uh, of my presentation here is uh, we are giving the videos a Creative Commons license. If you don't know what it is, it's basically that it can be distributed, it can be shared, but uh, the person who is making the videos, that will be you has to be credited and it cannot be used, the video cannot be used for commercial purposes, uh, sold or packaged in uh, products. It's just to have some rights uh, around it. But we want to share it openly and that's why we give it Creative Commons. We'll also come back on what we do with actually getting uh, the permissions from the participants to actually uh, broadcast this because this is very much needed uh, when we record them and uh, share them openly. Finally, and you don't want to go into that now, but just to mention, we're going to use a, a video editor called VideoShop, and we chose this one. I believe that Nissan made his on the iMovie, for those of you who are on Apple products. Uh, but the VideoShop is both on uh, Microsoft, on Android, and on Apple products, and that's why we want to find a, a video editor which is working. Well, we will come back to that. Just if there's some of you who wants to download it and play around with it, you're very welcome, but you will get a training 
in, in, in that, uh, both online and offline, for those of you who will be participating in Violet, but also the rest of you. So, yes, that was, uh, that was my uh, presentation. I'm, uh, yes, over to you, Angela.